Hi guys, where do I start? What a morning, what a day, what a day. I had it all planned out last night. Well, not, not so much planned. I like to do impromptu videos with, that are natural and not too much scripted. But I thought last night I was getting some great feedback on some forums about my previous videos, especially evangelizing with autism in people getting in touch with me saying uh, some saying you seem normal to me and others saying that they have they identify with the problems and I wasn't going to be very personal in this video I um, I it's almost like I'm scared to break open some old wounds and describe them to you in case I maybe get sucked back into that 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 hell because anxiety especially social anxiety disorder it ruins lives and I've got no doubt in my mind that many people find it so life destroying that they just kill themselves. Um, I haven't looked into the st statistics and I wonder if I even if I did how accurate they would be because in my own experience the doctors didn't know. Yes we're talking about a time predating the internet but around 2006 the doctors the GPs that I saw would and years before that would send, keep sending me to ordinary counsellors social anxiety was never mentioned not even the word anxiety. So I was left feeling that this was due to something in my childhood that had affected me. And I thought I was mad. I thought I was absolutely losing my mind. Had I known there was a name for it, and I remember getting extremely excited back in about 2006 because that was around the same time that, and I can't remember how it happened or what, I've seen so many doctors over the years, professors. I've been in a garage this morning just reading through some of my old I don't know if diagnostics is the word, but you know, this is from King's College London um, Institute of Psychiatry. Um, I believe that was from a therapist uh, in Buckingham somewhere. Um, another King's College one. King's College. Yeah, so King's College. Um, here we go. This is a letter from my GP at the time. This is dated September 2006. Many thanks for your referral of this 39-year-old man, whom I saw for an assessment on the 18th of September. Mr Burton experiences anxiety in a large number of social encounters. Getting very personal here. <clears throat> I made one earlier. I might start this all over again. This intro, this is, um, let's take this belt off. That was killing me.
Okay guys, okay guys, hi. Welcome to another video. And I've got to be honest with you, I don't know how to start this video. I, th I thought it would be relatively easy, like my last one, or the one previous, um, evangelizing with autism. And that's hit a nerve with a number of people. I've had some really lovely feedback, direct messages from people in feedback on forums. And whilst I try and compose myself to talk about such personal things, I don't know how much more personal you can get than owning up to having social anxiety disorder, something that destroys the lives of many. Um, I think, I think before I start on myself, let me give you the reason why I'm going to try and be completely open with you. You might see tears, you might see me getting flustered, but this is what social anxiety is like. This is the real, this is real. This is not some psychiatrist that's read a umpteen books on the subjects, on, on the subject of social anxiety disorder. This is someone who's lived with it, lived with it for many decades. I'm the real expert and you are too. If you, if you are if you have social anxiety disorder, you are more qualified than, than any of these therapists that I've seen, any of these professors over the years that I've seen, any of these psychologists, psychiatrists, whatever they like to call themselves. You, you cannot know what it's like unless you have it, unless it destroys your life on a daily basis. So you despair, you despair of life, you despair of life I, in, until you've had it that bad. I, I don't think you can really make a connection as a psychiatrist with someone unless that psychiatrist has had this personally. But let me just read one comment. I had quite a number, but th this one, I woke up this morning and the, 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 the girl in question had sent it overnight and it really struck a chord with me. Uh, le le let me read it to you. Thank you for reaching out, Andy. That's very nice of you to share your videos and honestly quite admirable to use your own hardships to help and educate others. I'll watch your video and look forward to your next one. That's from L. L suffers from social anxiety disorder and really she is the reason why I'm going to be as honest uh, and open as I can cope to be today. Because until I got this message, I was going to kind of skim over the surface and not get too personal. But if there's one person, if it's only L out there that may benefit from this video, then I'm willing to, I'm willing to try and disclose things that I wouldn't have otherwise touched on. Anyway, she goes on, just watching now, I'm curious if you don't mind the, the question about your autism diagnosis. Now this goes back to my previous video, the evangelism with autism. I've had a similar experience to you actually where a few people I've known who are on the spectrum, including my boyfriend, have recognised autistic traits in me, though I tend to shrug it off. However, what you're saying in the video about overstimulation is something I definitely experience almost daily. 
I get so flustered and it affects my ability to think or function until I can get to a dark, quiet place, ideally on my own. Now, how similar is that to, if you've watched the Evangelizing with Autism video, uh, th this, could, this could be um, some notes. See, I'm getting tearful. This is a very sensitive subject. Uh, and when people share these same problems, it, it's very quickly you make a connection. You, you feel like you know this person. Again, this is similar to what you've mentioned in the video. Yes, exactly. I mentioned that I like to withdraw from society, to go into a, a cool, even cold sometimes, dark place. It, it, it is the quickest way for me to feel, I, I don't know if you'd say safe, I suppose it is a safe, a safe space, but more than that, I want it to calm me down because when you've got social anxiety disorder, you feel like you're burning up. Uh, even in midwinter, mid if you're indoors, you can feel like you're burning up, especially if someone's got the heating on. Um, and you're in a social situation. Also too much light. Now, I, I, I've been outside this morning doing some, filming some B-roll for this video and it's very bright and sunny and I love, I love that. But it's the, the light that I'm talking about is in indoor light. When you're in a room and you've got strips of fluorescent light shining in your face and you've got a social situation going on in a room that has no windows to open or they're not open and the heating's on. You know what I'm talking about. If, if, if you've got social anxiety disorder, you know exactly what I'm touching on and the horror, the distress. Anyway, if I carry on, um, I know the diagnosis procedure can be very long and arduous, and I often wonder if there is much point in a diagnosis at all, as there is no cure or treatment, and with or without a doctor's signature and a fancy name, I'm still the same person with the same personality traits and issues as I've ever been. This is referring to the autism. It's saying that um, apologies if you're not comfortable sharing such personal information. There's no pressure. I'm just curious of your experience and advice. And then she goes on to say, Andy, sorry to message you again. I'm sorry it's late. I'm actually painting. Oh, OK. I'll cut that out because that's that's just for me. That's really helpful just for me. Well, yes, Al, to answer your your question, um, like you, your own experience where people that you know have pointed out to you that you have autistic traits that, from autistic people, they recognize the same traits in you. That's my experience um, of people with Asperger's or autism. They, they've told me, I, I think you've got autism. And it came as quite a shock. And I went to the doctors and I, I now realize that this is a common thing. If you go to the doctor, uh, maybe at a certain age, so I'm no teenager, as you can tell, maybe if I went as a teenager, I would have got a different, a different answer. Let me know, I'll be interested. But I, I went, uh, I've, I don't know how many years ago, maybe a decade ago and said, look, you know, people are telling me that I've, I've got autism traits can you diagnose me? And I only went to one doctor. Maybe I should have tried more. But that doctor said, quite bluntly, 
You're a train driver. You've made it this far. You're in your 40s. They're not going to be interested in diagnosing you. Scandalous, really. Now, Al was talking about overstimulation. Now, this is something, if you've got social anxiety disorder, or social phobia as it's sometimes referred to, the overstimulation I'm talking about is, say someone says to you, I'm inviting you to my wedding. I'm inviting you to a party. Let's meet up at the pub. Let's go across the road to the restaurant for a meal. Now, for any person with, without these struggles, either autism or social anxiety disorder, hey, great, let's go. Let's do it like tomorrow. But when, you, when you've got con the conditions that, that I've got, the thought of going to a wedding is so overwhelming. There's going to be so much noise, so many people. It's just too much. And just going for a meal, I like to, if you've got social anxiety disorder, it would surprise me if you're not exactly the same as me in thinking, OK, I, I, I want to go to a restaurant. I don't want to stay away, but I go to a restaurant if the lighting is low enough. If it's a quiet enough time of day or night, so that rules out Friday night, Saturdays, Sunday afternoons. So that's three days of the week that you can forget about. So it you can see how it can, just talking about going out to a restaurant or a pub or a wedding is severely hampered. And I, I lost a dear friend about 15 or so years ago. She invited me to her wedding and I really wanted to go to this wedding. But the time got closer and closer and I think it was the night before, I was in such a state that I had to tell her, look, I, I, I can't go. I, I can't go. And I can't remember how the conversation went, but it, 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 it didn't end well. Um, because people without this disorder do not understand it. And I realise now that, you know, the... She'd got a table set for me. Uh, she paid for the food and you know, all, all kinds of things that go with a wedding. You want to know the numbers that are turning up and you want those numbers to turn up. And but as. As you'll know, as a date gets nearer, the, the so the, 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 the terror. So if it's like a month away, you might be saying, yeah, I, I, you know, I'd like to go. And you say, yes. But as, as the time gets near, as it goes halfway through the month and you've got a couple of weeks to go, the, the pressure starts building. And it's, it's like a pressure cooker. It just keeps building and building and building until it comes to a point where you can't take it anymore because this condition is torture. It is mental torture of the highest kind. It's so relentlessly evil that I would never wish my worst enemy to, to have this condition. I can't comprehend, or it is that bad, I can't comprehend anything worse than having social anxiety disorder. You are alive, but you are so restricted, so dis, 
disabled. But do you get a blue badge? Do you get, because it's maybe classed as a unseen disability or invisible disability. Just even approaching a restaurant and saying to them, can I have a quiet table? Um, you can imagine, j j just even that is difficult enough. Um, what I tend to do is call up and say, look, you know, I I've got autism, which I find a lot easier to be open about with people than social anxiety disorder. And the there is a crossover, like Elle said in her message, that it's hard to it's hard for me if I understand what she's saying it's hard for me too to understand where that crossover happens because there's so many um, symptoms from social anxiety disorder that you could put in the camp of autism and vice versa it's very difficult to know where one one ailment uh, ends and another starts. Now I saw L had reviewed Anxiety UK, the website, the charity in Manchester, I believe they are. And Anxiety UK are helpful, um, a helpful place. However, they tend to focus on CBT now I've done a few CBT courses. It was a real pain because they they don't seem to be on your doorstep. I had to travel from here in Milton Keynes to South London and it really was South London. I'm not talking Waterloo. I'm talking you get on a train at Victoria, a mainline training, you know, you, you head towards the coast kind of South London. I can't remember the name of the place even though I went there enough. But the CBT for me, um, I've since learnt, is based on Buddhism principles, which had I known before, I wouldn't have bothered taking CBT. But the CBT is um, pretty terrifying. Uh, but, but when you're offered any kind of therapy, you want to you, you just think, wow, this is a lifeline. I've got to take it. Maybe, maybe this will fix me. Well, CBT, it did help me, but it wasn't easy. It's based on exposure therapy. So it would, I, I now I've got, I think, a six DVD set of my therapy sessions. And so they start you you start off slowly just talking to the to the counselor psychiatrist whatever she was called and it builds up to she will take you across to um the hospital's uh cafeteria oh, it's huge uh loads of people we'd be sitting on these there was these very long tables lots of them a uh, bit like a bit like a school, you know, a big school dining room. And she'd say to me, look up and look around at people. And I'd say to her, I, th I don't want to in case they're looking at me. Now I'll, just, I'll, explain, <laughs> I'll explain that fear in a moment. She says, just look up, look around the room. 
And it, and I hope you can understand this, the, the, the bravery it takes to lift your head up and look around the room. And she, she said to me, uh, no one's looking, are they? And I said, no, no, they're not. No, they're not. So that was a help. That was a help. But the reason that someone with social anxiety disorder would not want to look up and find it terrifying, debilitating to even try or even think about is because if they looked up and there was a person looking at looking at me, if I looked up and there was a person looking at me, I would immediately feel that that person was looking at me as some kind of weirdo who, whose face had gone the colour of my t-shirt, whose face was had gone as wet as, <laughs> as my peppermint um, in nettle tea. <laughs> and no, I'm not exaggerating. I, I'm not exaggerating. This is how I used to go, and it's it's like a grenade going off. It's that quick, the, the trigger. You can be absolutely fine, and you feel in control of the situation, and it's like putting a, it's quick as putting a pin out of a grenade, bang, your body explodes, and adrenaline courses through your arteries and your veins, and the blood just is instantly filling your face, so your face is all red, and you just start to sweat. And you are terrified to stay in that place where you are, but you're also equally as terrified to get up and get out of that place, because you feel that a, you'll draw more attention to yourself, and B, I've forgotten the B. It can be incredibly terrifying. And what happens is you get these what are known as learned behaviors and safety mechanisms develop. Okay, so for example, I went to college at Watford, or in Watford, and at break time, I'd come out of the whatever room I was learning in, and you'll come down the stairs with other students, and there'd be a door off of the stairway to this huge dining area. Now, as you're walking down the stairs, you can hear this noise, this clatter of knives and forks and spoons and dinner ladies, you know, what do you want? And slopping it on people's plates and trays banging on desks and laughing and the cacophony. And <clears throat> it was hell on earth. It was hell on earth to be there. And so you start to avoid it. You start thinking, why am I going to put my myself through this? Why am I going to overload all my senses so what I do, I just 
I won't go in the dining room. I won't go in the dining hall. And what happens then? So the people that know you at college start to realise you're not with them and that you're different. And what could I tell them? You're talking about 1985, 1986. Um, that's like 15 years away from... Oh, that's 20 years away from me being diagnosed. I had no idea what the problem was. I thought I was mentally, well, I thought I was mad. I thought I was mad. And then you leave college and you can't just stay at home. You've got to get, you've got to get a job. So my first job was in a factory. Now, that wasn't too bad because um, I was working kind of on my own. <clears throat> but then for health reasons, I couldn't do that anymore. I was working with trichoethylene degreasing metals before they were electroplated. And that was really affecting my asthma. So I uh, um, started working in a, in a shop. <laughs> and... That was, that, that could be utterly terrible because although I liked it and I made many friends, this is the irony, I would make, have no trouble um, having customers befriend me, come in and, you know, I was a lot younger then, you know, come in and say, oh, Andy, you know, borrow this CD, you know, make your own copy and I think you'll love it. Because I was selling hi-fi and TVs and videos and cameras and stuff. <clears throat> and <clears throat> so it, was, it, it wasn't all bad. But when my social anxiety was at its worse, <clears throat> there didn't need to be anyone else involved. I could be in that in a shop on my own. I worked in different shops all over the place. There was one shop I was working in and whenever a customer would come in the door would make quite a loud clicking noise. So it could all be very very quiet. Now if you've got autism you'll I think you'll relate to this. You don't need social anxiety I don't think to to know what I'm talking about. You're on your own, you're in, you're in your own mind thinking or concentrating on or working on something in this clicking noise, this loud clicking noise, and it just like, <gasps> and it's, you just stop breathing, you know, and because it's taken you out of that moment, you are comfortable and it's broken the silence uh, it's given you a rude awakening and you don't even have to see who it is coming in to the shop to talk to you because you're already gone from calm to you know all, all, all your fuse boxes all your MCB switches are just uh, uh, have tripped out and now you've got this customer coming towards you and your face is burning. It's bright red, maybe sweating too. And you don't want to be there. But this is, that was my job. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't just lock the door and put closed on the sign. <clears throat> you know, you, I had to, serve these multiple people in that in that state in that condition and i don't know of many more things or anything really that would have been more humiliating talk about humble someone 
talk about break someone um, and to have, like I say, this is a daily, daily trouble and to have it for decades, you can, I, I, I dread to think the amount of stress that I've put on my body. You know, I, I was getting stressed just even trying to get ready to, f to film this episode. I remember coming back one night from work in the shop and this is a strange one. I'd really, really love to know if any of you with social anxiety disorder has ever had this happen to you. <clears throat> so I've come home from working in the shop. I've closed my door. I've locked it. At this point, I was living at home. So I've locked my bedroom. I've sat on the bed and the social anxiety was so high, so bad that I could feel my face burning and me sweating and the adrenaline overloading me. There was no one there. I was on my own. Isn't that strange? No, no one else around. But I had social anxiety so bad <clears throat> that there didn't need to be anyone around. Um, my grades suffered at school, you know, I didn't, couldn't get any qualifications, couldn't concentrate at, at school. Um, so that's an, another thing where if you're a youngster at school, college, and you've got this, you know, um, on, on top of, you know, talk about handicap, you know, isn't it bad enough as it is to be a child? to be a student, all that stress of what you're going to do when you leave school and the stress of learning social interaction. Um, and if you haven't got an academic mind, just the struggle of trying to learn anything. But then you put on that person I'm talking personally now, you put on that person social anxiety disorder and autism, albeit high function autism, and it's a recipe for despair. It's a recipe for someone to just want to become a recluse and just say, I'm done. I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I'm just going to. Wow, it's just, it's just come. It's just come to me. Back in the late eighties, I was so distressed, and I used to drive over to Oxford Way often to see someone, and. On the route, I'd go past a sign advertising a mental hospital. Um, it was called Stone, or it, it's in a place called Stone, between Aylesbury and Oxford. And I was really serious about driving to that. I was so naive, I thought I could just drive to that hospital 
and just say, I'm mentally ill. Can I just stay here forever? And I just used to imagine that they'd be, they'd put me in a, in a room with white sheets and I'd, I'd just stay there forever, a, a recluse um, due to mental health. You know, you're, you're, you're looking for help. You're looking for help and there is no help, especially when you can't even tell someone what's wrong with you. I go to the GP, like I said in the intro, explain, I'd say, I'd say to them, I remember going to a, a GP and saying, look, I, I don't know what's wrong with me. I'll be, I'll be in a supermarket, I'll be in the queue I'll be at the back of a queue to at the checkout. It'd get to my turn, and then it only took one person to come in behind me, and I felt that they were watching me, you know, pack or trying to pay, and I would freak out. I would lose my mind. My fuse would go bang, and my, I don't mean temper, my, you know, my face would go red and I'd swear and, and the GP just sent, referred me to a counsellor where we talked about my childhood. So even these professionals didn't know, they, they, they should have known with the symptoms that I was describing that it was an anxiety issue. While I just gather some more thoughts, As you know, I'm a Christian. I like to tell people about Jesus. And I read through the Bible. This is relevant, so please stay with me. I read through the Bible every year. And today I just sat down. It happened to be that I was going to start a book in the New Testament called 2 Corinthians. Now, of all the days in the year that I could have started in 2 Corinthians, it happens to be the morning of wanting to do a video about being in great distress. I, I, I think you'll get something out of this if you just listen to me. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Very interesting, isn't it? I, I, I suspect this would be interesting even if you're not a Christian. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure. Isn't that an interesting term? Pressed out of measure. I think that's a good description of how people with social anxiety feel 
we're pressed out of measure above strength in so much that we despaired even of life. Isn't that what I was describing? Isn't that what I was feeling? Isn't that what I was feeling all these years? Despairing of life itself. So going back to this referral from my GP in 2006 to King's College London Institute of Psychiatry. Ah, here it is, Denmark Hill, Centre for Anxiety Disorders and Trauma, 99 Denmark Hill. That was a long way to go. Mr. Burton experiences anxiety in a large number of social encounters. His predominant fears are of blushing and sweating and this makes him feel conspicuous and the centre of attention. Problematic situations are typically those where he may be in close proximity to other people who could observe him for an extended period of time, e.g. sitting on a tube train. He finds interactions in groups problematic also and interactions with people he has met previously tend to be more anxiety provoking than those with complete strangers. Yeah, that's interesting. Do you find too that on a sliding scale it, it is often less traumatic to feel anxious in front of a stranger than it is with someone you know. I used to have great difficulty um, seeing people that I knew. If I was out and about, I would I would love to I, I used to love going to towns where I would th think that no one is going to know me here Be because I'll give you an example. A number of years ago I was in Sainsbury's and someone I knew came up to me and Andy and isn't that awful that even a friend can give you send you into this level of despair and distress it's, it's just it's so strange and you know, I'm not sure if I would understand it unless I'd experienced it myself um, and the, the reason it's good to be around strangers is strangers are far more unlikely to come up to you um, suddenly and start talking and when you're not up to it because many times you just want to be on your own if you're going to the shops that is a big enough thing going to the shops you 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 can't handle a social layer on top of that other than because the in the interaction with the member of staff for example would be enough to put a level of that on top with interaction with a friend for example is overwhelming it's just it's too much associated social fears include not having enough to say in conversation situations mm, I don't get that anymore I can't remember that um, I think there is a fear that what you know, um, it's it's hard to when you're so preoccupied with how you feel. It, it it's hard to come up with topics of conversation. Um, although I I do love talking, and I'm at, I actually love being sociable. It, 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 isn't that sad that? Um, In no pun intended, SAD is an acronym for social anxiety disorder, but 
isn't it yeah sad isn't it sad that I I love being sociable I love meeting new people and I love my friends and I love going to church but sometimes you think these things are impossible and people don't understand and I guess you can I can come across as rude because they, they, they think well why don't you want to come out why don't you want to socialize why do you want to always leave church early or somewhere early because I'm I'm exhausted these conditions exhaust you and I feel that it's better to get out before so like I've had a good morning at church or a, um, a good time socially I feel that it's better to leave while you're ahead than stay and when you're getting tired and risk having a sudden onset of uh, of anxiety because what's happened in the past you could be having a great time somewhere socially i'll give you an example um i could be i was what okay i was selling my bike on ebay i had this pretty expensive mountain bike a number of years ago and I, w I wanted to sell it I wanted to get a road bike which was more suitable for my commute to the station and I put it on eBay and this guy turns up with a woman and and a daughter I think maybe the daughter was maybe 10 or something I can't quite remember but I thought the woman that this young guy was with was his, was his mum and this example is about f social faux pas that can just you know it's normal for people when to make a faux pas to want the earth to <laughs> swallow them up but when you've got social anxiety on top of that it's not just a feeling it's an outward it's an out, outward um, indicator of your feeling so if you haven't got social anxiety you can you know the person might not know that you wish that you're feeling distressed that you want the ground to swallow you but when you've got social anxiety it, it it's pretty obvious to the whole world that you're greatly distressed and they were in this room and we're sitting down he's already taken it for a ride it loves it wants to buy it and stupid me turns to him and, and says uh, is your mum okay with it or something like that and he 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 looked at me and I can't remember if he re replied but I then got this horrible feeling that it was his wife or <laughs> girlfriend oh and so of course my face is all red and I'm sweating and and they must have been looking at me thinking now yeah she the wife or or the mother wasn't in the room it was just me and the guy and she came in afterwards and sat down and they were they were going to write the check out and there's me looking like well I just felt like oh, I don't know how to describe it like they might be thinking that I'm losing my call because the bike is stolen and it's not actually mine I'm just it's stolen goods and I'm just selling it 
and it's come to the money stage and I'm just losing my nerve a little bit. So I think, I don't, let me know, but am I the only one with an overactive imagination in social situations that when I have social anxiety, all these crazy negative thoughts go through my head. Oh, they must think I'm a criminal. They must think I've nicked the bike. Oh, wow, he must be so insulted that I've just said to him that this, maybe his wife is his mum. You know, what a, you know, what a terrible mistake. Now, the, the, the ongoing thing with this is you get to a stage where you don't want to say anything for fear of these blasted faux pas. So it just exacerbates the problem. Associated social fears include not having enough to in conversation situations, others staring at him and judging him as anxious, weak or odd. Mr Burton dates his social anxieties back to the age of approximately 16. Oh man, yeah, this is bringing it back. Boy, have I got an example to give you. Wow. Though he describes himself as unconfident, Throughout his mid-childhood and teenage years, as a result of his social anxieties, he has lost jobs and has endured his current work environment with some considerable distress. He has not maintained friendships as he would have wished over the years and can become highly frustrated and miserable about his difficulties at times. Mr Burton fulfills criteria in DSM-4 that's in Romans numerals, one in a V, for social phobia. Now, that's interesting. I haven't read this for, uh, well, this is 12 years old. Um, I think DSM-4 is the book, it's a big textbook, I believe, about criteria for autism. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's really interesting, because I wouldn't have known about what, what on earth DSM-4 is. Uh, was back way back then but yes this example that um, 16 years old okay picture this I'm at school work experience well I love photography it's what I've been doing at school it's what I've been doing at college this is before college <laughs> There's someone at the door. Let me go and try and witness to this person. Let's just un unplug. This would be interesting. <laughs> 